who continuing on with um, doing this payment system uh, with the point now where uh, within the system you need to be able to add shops to your business add workers to your business and then like have them be able to log on whatever and it's okay if the interfaces are horrible right now that's not okay. actually the issue it's to make sure that everything is that there is a path to putting the stuff on the screen that needs to be there so this is all like kind of in-user facing stuff um and then going back and kind of making it prettier uh coming up with some kind of uh interface concept that will work for them <coughs> for the customers because I, I don't know. I'm never good at like thinking about that stuff ahead of time so anyway I've got um well so this is gonna barf so what's happening is uh let me stop this. okay so um starting out logged out Okay, so front screen. Um, log in with a uh, public key, log in with a password, or register a new new thing. Um, log in. This it's already got one. So this is the wallet coming up to sign. Uh, yeah, I'll let this thing connect to me. Um, and. So here's saying localhost at 8080 is asking this account, which is the currently loaded one, to sign a message. And the message is this. Um, now over here, it's saying verify this is what the wallet's showing you. This is the message you're supposed to sign. This is the key that the page is saying it's identified as being in the wallet. So these should match, right? And they do. So we confirm the signature, and it shows up here. Um, then we submit it and bah, we're logged in. Okay, so this user is the owner of this business. And so his front page is just the, a summary of the business for today. Um, what's happened today? Now, it is the 27th. This is the 26th. So this is actually within the last 24 hours that we'll show here. And these are transactions that are like actively in memory. We're not reading these from disk disk stuff is going to be archived anything older than 24 hours will be archived to disk and still be accessible we can still pull them and show them but it'll be in, in their archive not the last 24 hours snapshot uh, that we're going to show so um so like this you know that the time zone offset like that's just an artifact that well, i'm going to pull that off <clears throat> later um if we make a new sale we do some amount of AE, submit it. Okay, that's the QR code. If you take uh, a phone with uh, the superhero wallet on it and show it that QR code, it will generate a transaction to um, that recipient, right? And then you send it, and then you want to check the status on the network, right? And so this page is going to be active and ask, like, I don't know, every couple seconds it'll ask and say, is it is you know daddy over there yet and uh that'll be that that will update to paid um if you go back to the top page this serial number 10 is now here um and this was a mistake uh the payments that had been done previously so it, it should show a breakdown of like whatever cashiers you've got that are working at a specific place and I haven't decided if I like that or not. I might just do it where it's like um, all of them just mixed together. I don't know. I haven't decided. I want to show, like, break it up by cashier. Like, instead of by cashier, I could just have it, like, uh, the cashier's ID just be in here and have that clickable, right? You could, like, click to jump to that guy's page that's got his stuff. I don't know. I haven't have not decided that yet. But those are those kind of interface questions that, like, can be dealt with later. Um, what's happened here, You got, it's the same headers as this, but there's nothing in here yet. Um, so like, this is one shop and this is another shop, right? So like if we make, let's so add a shop, um, the shop name would be, um, you know, 
yet another pizza shop or or just imagine like you have uh you want to set up a location at a mall um and so the mall's name is like i don't know the big mall um yeah whatever um the mall shop pizza pizzas or seven i'm just making this up phone number um whatever and then we create that okay so we've got the big mall shop we just made the Corinza shop which i was messing with earlier and made um some guys pizza company whatever like the first shop name is always whatever you create the business as um I actually don't like the order of this i think i'm going to reverse the order anyway so the thing that you got there is we have current shop which means like if i make a new sale which shop does that apply to so we want to change the we want to be able to change the current shop so change shop now that we can add shops we want to be able to have logged in as the boss like right now or as a worker doesn't matter and be able to change which shop we're at and then we should be able to create new sales that go to one of these different places right um shouldn't be super hard to do uh so how do we change shop i don't know yet because i've never done this um so change shop. now in this case we know we have a user and we know that he's got a business he belongs to and he has a current shop too um so whoop. so we're going to get the business And the business has like a list of shops in it, like a list of shop IDs, <clears throat> which means we can pull those one by one and make like a menu, pick the one you want to go to. And it, you know, we'll be able to get that back as like a form post. And, you know, um, we should be able to make that work without, without too much craziness. Um, That said, do we want to have a button that they click? You could do that. Or do we want to have a selector, like a list of shop names, and you pick one and hit submit? With the current one picked to start with. That seems kind of not too bad. Try it that way, and if it sucks, I'll just change it later it's not I mean, like i said interface this is these are just this is just dumb stuff so shops shops equals um be a little bit more clear about this okay shop id and then shop ids uh, so we're going to ask the ledger look up the business get the shop ids out um, the body, so the body is just going to be some HTML that we're going to write. And this body should be like really simple. Um, I, I don't ever remember how the option stuff works. There's like HTML options, some shit option oh look there we go format currency options and i know there's a th Ooh, okay we're gonna do that i have before select oh holy crap okay so it's a select and then so that creates a selector 
thingy. And then currency options is going to be, in this case, Oh, okay, so this is already running. So there's a function format currency options. That, okay, I'll read that in a second. Um, okay, so select. Let's do a label first. Uh, wait, 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 wait. No, 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 no. First, I need to create a form. form uh, this is all the HTML stuff that I never remember so like I always have to look it back up when I'm doing it I don't think it um, what the encoding type does is like if you have a form with a whole bunch of different stuff if you just leave it as like default it'll um, URL encode all the stuff in it and send you this like giant blob of crap that looks like quarks, like the um, query arguments for in a URL. I think actually we've got an example here. Here we go. Okay, so what had happened here? This is this is the post request when we created the new shop. This was the body of that post. Was this uh, shop name the big mall and address one two three the the mall and email blah 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 and blah blah blah. blah. Okay. Um, and then, of course, we like parse that and pull it apart and do its pieces and, you know, yay. Um, what the multi part form thing does is it breaks things up in a little bit. I mean, it's kind of a more clean way, but I mean, unless you're like watching the network traffic, you don't really care. Um, anyway, for this, we're selecting like one thing. So it doesn't matter. Really? Oops, I'm silly. Okay, form method post. We're going to open a form. And oh, so Airline has like automatic line continuations. So this with no comma coming to here just continues on. It's just one string. It just looks better for me. <coughs> um, when you do. You'll notice that I'm opening a list here. So what I'm doing is I'm just massively cheating by assembling a deep list. So each so strings are lists or binaries in Erlang. It doesn't matter which one you pick. I prefer strings in when I'm coding because it's just nicer. It's also way better to deal with like Unicode as lists than uh, binaries. And because I have to do um, Japanese mixed with English and whatever, it's it's like vastly superior to use lists. Um, so there, like, there actually is a very concrete technical difference. Um, but once you get into Unicode, but if you're just doing like ASCII characters, it doesn't really matter. Um, anyway, so here, uh, what I'm doing is I'm opening a list, and what that lets me do is that even though these are like continuations, I'm gonna hit places in here, like when I wanna list the shops, it's gonna change for each user. I'm just gonna have a function that returns a list of string segments. And that nested, that's a nested list of strings inside of a larger, deeper list of nested strings, right? Um, which makes, there's no, concatenation overhead or anything until the very end after I've assembled the, what the whole page looks like. Like if you look at this one over here, right? Um, you'll see like HTML that you're familiar with, right? So label for blah and then comma, then your name. Um, your name is a label that might be uh, Japanese, this right here, Shiosha, yeah, so Shiosha me, or it could be your name in English, right? Either one will show up here, but that base that's based on the language. So again, I'm this is I'm super just gliding over interface concerns here, kind of cheating as I go. Um, but what that is is it means that this body, this HTML body, um, 
is a list of it's a list of strings which may also contain a list of strings so the currency options thing currency options is the result of a function um, format currency options which is being mapped over the available rates the available um, uh, currency rate uh, currency symbols that the AJ rates module is aware of so it asks AJ rates what currency symbols do you have it tells it, it returns a list of currency symbols and then this function uh, format currency options is like mapped over that to create HTML uh, to format each currency option as a as a as an option within the list of currencies that you might want to use um, so, and I'm not, each time I encounter one of these places where I'm like adding a thing in, I'm just adding another element to a giant list that's a deep list of stuff. And at the very end, very last thing before we send it back to, to show you here, render. Um, so the render function is the final thing before it goes out on the socket. Um, it checks like what kind of uh, response it's sending. So if the like if the body's empty, it knows exactly what to do. So it sends this back. Um, it's just matching on the body being empty. Uh, where's the part before this? Okay, so the response. Where was response? Result. Right, so um, if the body's empty, then we do this. If we do have a body that's a payload and it's a data type, then we check what the type is and we just put the payload in at the bottom. It's like we're sending an image or something back. Um, if, however, <clears throat> the response is uh, not a data type, if it's like an actual normal text response type, um, in which case we're not matching on any of those things, uh, we go to render page and render page. So we're the top bar gets added here. Then we go to render page. Where page is that? Okay. And so render page in this case, like we have a text body that we're going to send back a page to, to the user. Um, we add the HTML like preamble and the close up stuff down here. And um, <laughs> I don't like web stuff very much. Uh, and you can tell us from some of the function names. Favicon shit has to get put in there. Um, the top bar already came from that previous function and the body gets just dumped in there. Um, that's all content. So the content is itself another layer of this deep list. And the final thing we do is we turn that into what I'm calling it, the payload. Um, I'm calling it this function called Unicode characters to binary. And what that does is it takes any kind of mixed up list it could be binary utf-8 binaries mixed with um lists list type string data that could be utf-8 or could be whatever um and it could with arbitrary layers arbitrary depth in that list and it flattens it out into a single utf-8 binary a, a unicode single unicode binary uh, encoded in utf-8 and that's what I get here is the payload. And the reason I have to do that, I actually could send the steep list over the socket directly. It would it would flatten the whole thing out for me also. But what I need the uh, the binary for is in the HTML response going back out to the client, um, the content length has to be the number of bytes that's in the body, right? So we're populating content length. Uh, we take the payload, we get the byte size of the payload, 
And then that byte size is like an integer. Well, it has to be changed into a list so it can be part of the header, so integer to list. So we're measuring the size of the payload and putting that in the header right before we send it. And then we're just attaching that exact payload right here at the end. Um, and that's data and we've returned that. That's our final like render page result. Um, and if we see where that goes here, um, render, yeah, render page. So in the case that it's a page, we do that. But there's a couple of other, so this is ID none. Um, that's if you're not logged in. It gets more complicated if you are logged in because there's admin pages and the top bar changes and there's like, you know, if you're an administrative user, there might be like an admin menu at the top and, you know, things change based on who you are within the system. So, um, so the render, the render thing gets a little bit more complicated if you're logged in, um, cause it's going to check like who you are, um, and then change the view based on that. Anyway, that's kind of how this stuff works more or less. It's um, <clears throat> any, oh, actually I was at, I was looking at the, uh, the options thing, right? That one. Where was the form options? Oh wait, I don't know. It was select. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Select. Okay. So what I need here is I'm going to do a select. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm done. Label. I do want to label this. Actually, I want to do a field set first. So field set. Like, I don't know. I'll care about that later. I'm thinking like through what should the size of this be, but I, don't, I guess it doesn't matter. Um, not yet. Once I get something on the screen, I can make a, a decision about like if it's dumb or not. So legend. Ooh, okay. So I need to get the language. Okay. Um, so if this is a Japanese user, it's an English user. Okay. What are my labels going to be? What? Um, pick job. Okay. Um, I'm not sure what really the right tone for this is. Um, temple. That's probably. It's literally shop pick, right? Nah. Um, select shop and then chops mm -hmm. feels redundant but And then what are we going to have? Um, so select or uh, return, like cancel, sort of, which we usually say more than so like. Okay. And then. Uh, Uh, that's good enough. Whatever. I, I, 
I'm not good at doing this part. So, uh, pick shot. And then... Legend, pick shot, and then label... Um, or... I gotta pick what this is gonna be called. <clears throat> I probably won't even need the label um, indicator, but if I the thing is, if you start dressing the page up with like JavaScript elements later, um, then you kind of want to have the label for blah, and you don't just want an ID; you also want the name and stuff like that. So um, it's it's nice to go ahead and get that stuff in place now. And then later, if I write, like, if I include a script to do stuff, then, you know, whatever. JavaScript. Um, just, again, I just web stuff in general is not my favorite. Uh, shop picker. What is it called? Shop picker. That's good enough. Um, shop. Oh, look at me. I'm done. Um, pick. Oh, ooh. That don't match. No. Um, oh, we're in the label. Okay. And now I want. Select name dot picker okay. and I okay. um So we have to make up shop up at some point, which I don't know how I'm going to do that yet, but I will figure it out in a second. Let's see. Do we actually need a pattern cast for this? I don't think we do. Um, whatever. What I do need, though, is I need this. Always need that. I should make a function that like makes a form for me because like I do these repeated elements all the time. Like I could, <clears throat> well, okay, the style thing. That's the thing. That's the problem with like angle bracket languages is it's not a simple way. It's not 100% simple. It's just like pull things out. You wind up still having some redundancy even in your kind of collapsed down function that renders like a form for you because you might insert style stuff, you might insert class stuff, you might whatever, so you wind up having like a bunch of options. So you wind up having functions that have like lots of, you know, extra arguments potentially, and it's stupid. Um, anyway. Okay, so it's not a submit button this time, it's a select button. So like I made a function for nav buttons because they're so annoying to deal with. I should do one with um, forms. I just haven't. Uh, oh, okay. So see, as long as this returns um, a list of strings or whatever, um, then I can just drop it right in the middle and call it there. It's not like an issue. So a field set then closes. So we're going to close the field set. And then close the form. And we did not do any silly stuff outside of just making this. So it should be fine. Um, okay, so shop options, I've got to render that somewhere. Shop options is going to be a map over a 
It's going to be uh, whatever. Format dot options. Okay, so that's going to be the right basic idea. Format shop options. Format shop options. Um, okay. Now the thing is, I need to have the current ID selected when we start this. So I'm going to start with shop ID. Okay. So what I'm doing right now is to like, I don't like to think about too many things at the same time. <laughs> so what I'm doing is I'm going to write a function here. It's going to take the current shop ID and like, remember what it is. And it's going to create a function as a return value. And it's, I'm going to label it format shop options. Um, and then I'm going to use that function that is written or created by this. This function is going to create a function that will remember what the current shop ID is. So when it sees that shop ID specifically, it'll make that one be selected within the, the selector list. And then all the other ones will just be formatted like normal. So that's, that's what I'm going to do right now. And the reason I'm doing that is I could write this as a Lambda right here in line, but it's like too much stuff on the, I don't like functions that get all big and gross. Um, I mean, look at this. Um, it, it's better to just separate it out and it's easier to think. Then I can test that, that function in isolation. I don't have to be inside of this call to be able to see what's going on. Like if I massively screw up the shop options generator, the formatter for doing shop options, I can just like compile this module, export that one function and just play with it and see what's wrong instead of having it all be inside of one giant function like that. I hate that. Um, so this is kind of me preserving my sanity right here. Uh, format shop options or Okay, current shop. Right. So what is this going to have to do? It's going to be a function. And it's going to accept a shop ID. And the first thing it's got to do is get a hold of the shop. From the ledger which is actually just a lookup in ETS. Um, okay. And then what does it need to do? It needs to... What was the... Uh, I don't remember what the options format looks like in here. What's this? Currency options? Format currency option. Oh. I'm dumb. It's right. It was right next to my cursor. Format currency options. Option value selected. Oh, selected. Okay. So that's the difference that I like can't remember. Um, now I have a function like shop name. Yeah. Okay. So it's going to be something like this. Right. And Shop net. Oh, no, no, no. The actual value is going to be. Right. So it needs to be the text version of the shop ID. The ID is an integer. So I'm just doing integer to list to make that. Okay. And then shop name. And that means shop name needs to be. I think that I've got a function called shop name. I do. Okay. So, so that's correct, except, uh, format currency. Right. So format currency. So in here, 
selected. Selected is going to be case current shop is the same as shop ID. Well, false is going to be Let me put a space there. Okay. Case, if the current shop is the shop ID, if that's true, then we're going to put the little selected tag in there. If it's false, it'll just be the empty string. It just won't have happened. <coughs> um, which I can put... In here. What's the return value? Okay. All right. So uh, this is defining a lambda, like an anonymous function that just closes over current shop so that this comparison can happen. And then this function is going to be returned back up here. Get that as its label name. And then we're going to map format shop options over the shop IDs. And then that's going to give us our list of option values, which will be this string thing um, that will be plopped inside of the select element of the page. And then that's that. Uh, it's my yeah so my responses when everything is like okay are whoa no 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 we're not gonna do that better um my input methods go bonkers so uh the state so all the return values from this so there's a response record um then it gets populated with like the http code or yeah http code the appropriate slogan which actually could be like kind of whatever it's i don't think they're actually defined as being like i don't think the standard actually says you must do these specific slogans for these specific codes, but I'm following like, you know, what everyone's expecting. So um, anyway, the body will be that. So that should be the chain shop function, unless I screwed it up. Let's see. So I'm just going to rebuild the whole thing. I could rebuild just the client, but oh, look at that. I screwed up. Um, oh, I didn't put an of in there dumb look at that case i was thinking too much about the case of the i don't usually one line these normally i do this like I do, this is actually my i'll just do it this way because um this is actually what i prefer is like that because it's really clear to read um and i can leave it like that hey look they came four lines i don't give a shit um okay so what should happen now is boink. If I click change shop, yeah, look at that. Okay. Yeah, see, so I've got that worked. Um, and if we look at the uh, the page source, what we'll see. Well, this is a horrible way to look at page source. It's just one line. Um, <laughs> okay, not showing you guys the best way to look at page source, am I? Yeah, Durka Durka blah blah. Legend. Where's the thingy? Here we go. So this is the um 
options value and then selected. Yeah, selected is shop number two, which is the one that we're actually at, right? So if I go to top here, current shop, some guys pizza two, and then that one's selected when we came in here. Um, and I have my select button is disabled. I didn't notice that. So the danger of copy pasting code. <clears throat> um, I don't know if I like that, like the way this is, but I can just get rid of this label entirely. I kind of want that to be bigger. It seems kind of goofy. Um, whatever. It doesn't matter that much. Anyway, for right now, that's kind of okay. I think I'm going to get rid of the label, though, because it's going to try me bonkers just because it's there. So, ooh, okay. Oh, actually, uh, this is going to be interesting. So, change shop, select shop. Oh, I can't do select right now. I can only do cancel. Um, that's dumb. Okay, what was the deal here? Disabled. Huh. Okay. Hmm? What's this? Shops is unused. Oh, yeah, it is. So those little warnings are nice because... They tell you silly things. There's less sitting around. Whatever, it doesn't matter for now. Um, <coughs> so, some guys pizza. If I let's just say I pick Corinza, select 404. Now, why did I do a 404? What happened was this. So this was the post to D with the payload or the, the body of the request was shop picker equals three um and over here in dispatch if we look at the way the dispatcher is working um if it's a get method if the request method is a get then it'll select from this if it's a post it selects from this and there are no implemented posts for that right so so um what has to happen here is we have to make change shop be a thing not implemented change shop as a Whatever. Um, <clears throat> now, the paternity test thing. I should probably do is because. So, the paternity test, what that is, it's a hidden element and it's the cross site. Uh, scripting thing. <coughs> and we have a user who's logged in. So this guy's logged in. So we have an ID, we have a UID, which means we can do the check in the next iteration here. Um, so change shop is going to look a lot like this. So 
not as involved as the um, not going to be anywhere near as involved. As the new shop thing is, but actually, okay. Um, what was it? Shop. Picker. It'll be shop ID string. And oh, actually, bin. And then uh, address. It's not address, it's paternity tests. So that's what uh, AJ Karen, the module AJ Karen does. Is it does um, it does the uh, I, I keep thinking of them as paternity tests because that was the kind of silly verbiage that I used. When I wrote the module sort of in a half joking state, um, but that's the um, cross site request thing to. That's the invisible part of the form, right? That you can't, like, you wouldn't know it's random every time. Um, so it generates those, it keeps track of them, and then you can verify by calling Karen again, say, hey, is this valid or not? <clears throat> and uh, also does the same thing with um, uh, captions. It's got a, a an English and Japanese language <clears throat> captcha is implemented in there. A really simple one, but it works, and... None of the robots have seen it yet, so they don't know what to do. Another thing, though, is that we don't, we don't really have a problem with um, a lot of bot issues because um, none of the form stuff is like visible until you've logged in, uh, or if you've like used a key to get in. So it's not not been that huge of a deal. But uh, anyway. We'll see. Now, if that's okay, then we're going to go change dot two with shop ID. Okay, well, let me get an actual shop ID binary to integer, which in this case is saying binary, binary data as a string. So binary string to integer. It's not um, like binary values. We have a sent. There's a specific syntax for that in your line. I'm commenting a bit on like Erlang basics <clears throat> now because it's. It turns out that some of the people watching these videos are like new to Erlang and don't know it, and they're like watching this to kind of get some idea of what Erlang like how it works. So, whatever. Um, okay, so we're gonna go with the shop ID, which is now an integer. So remember, I selected three a second ago. Well, three is going to come in as a string three, a binary string three. So I'm converting that to an integer, drop ID. And then um, the sample is a binary blob, and we want that as a binary blob. It's like just a bunch of goo. And I want it in that form because that's what Karen's going to understand. Um, and then if we get poop that, what am I going to do? We're going to put a warning. Um, user functioning to change shop. Um, so I'm just 
because the string will get long and like run off the edge of the thing, it's dumb. So I'm just making a label for what the message is. Um, putting the function name so I can find this. There's a macro for the function name, but it's like longer than the name of the function. So I rarely use it because there's another one for the arguments too. So you could totally identify a function <clears throat> by making a thing that says, um, you can just embed in the string the macro uh, function name and then I think it was function arity. But if you think about that, function name and function arity, okay, that's good. But then I can't, because those are macros, I can't macro those out into another function that builds that message for me in like a compact way without doing a parse transform. And parse transform are like, that's the root of all evil. So I'm not, I don't know. They actually do have their place, but I'm not going to mess with it here when I can just type the name of the function in there and then just like let it go. I don't like it. It's not that big deal. Um, so, but I do need arguments. Now I've got, these are the Erlang like um, string substitution tags. So I'm going to put the user ID and then the whole map. I just want to print the whole map in the log so I can come see like what was wrong with it. And then give that guy <clears throat> the cursed return. Um, cursed is uh, a function that I've got to handle like stupid um, stupid returns. So like errors. If, uh, if I'm turning any kind of non-200 response, um, I used cursed. Uh, it, it's just a, a, you know, old mud reference for when you do things that are impossible that nobody remembers these days. Anyway, uh, so we're going to call this with shop ID and sample. I'm going to do another check here. Case AJ Karen. Oh, we need the. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so Karen remembers what challenges have been issued based on user ID or based on IP address. Um, so we can do either one. Uh, so AJ Karen. Um, lab check. UID. Oh, true, and we have all, false. and I think there's a time. So. Okay, so these are our three possibilities. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, blah, blah. Okay, I'm pretty sure that that's right. Well, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got an example here. Object UID sample. Yep. Okay. Um, so, happy path first. If that is where we're at, then um, my user record my user record is going to have the shop value set as shop ID. Then I think I believe update yeah there we go. Um uh, client manager so it remembers me. I'm going to go ahead and put that in there now. And then um, state the user is updated. Okay. And then Old shop ID.
So I haven't firmly sorted out yet. The workers and managers thing inside of a shop, I'm thinking that I probably don't actually need that. They can pick what shop they're at. Um, shouldn't be like a big authority thing. Figure that out. I don't think there's checks right now in AJ Ledger. About that, let's see if I've got a worker thing. Yeah, I don't have a workers and managers thing in there right now. So I don't think it actually matters. I think what matters is just what's on the user record. <clears throat> and I think I can actually get rid of the shop workers thing. later we'll try whatever um i'll give this a shot new state and uh do -do -do. so that's posted back here i actually need to redirect on it i need to redirect to the um this I need to redirect just like this. Boink. It's going to be new state instead. So it's going to be a redirect 303, go back to the front. Yeah, that should be good. And then what's my bad case? Okay, so if they time out, we'll just bounce them back to the screen again, which will like reset the Karen thing. They'll hit submit twice, basically. Um, and timeout's like 10 minutes. If you can't make a decision about what shop you're in 10 minutes, then you just sat there too long. And if you did sit there too long, I think it's appropriate to kind of go back to that same page and kind of redo. So let's see if, how many typos did I have? That's the big question. None. No way. Okay. So let's go to change shop. I'm going to change to Corinza Mall. Oh, hey, dude, that worked. Okay, so let's do a new sale. Blah, submit, check, go back to the front. Oh, look at that. Bam. Okay, so <clears throat> this is actually working. As intended. So if I change shop to um, the big mall, just had disk skin. That's why it took a second. So the big mall, new sale at the big mall for a gajillion, jillion. That's a lot of money. Okay. Um, okay. So. That. Yeah. Okay, cool. So this is working as I had hoped. Um, okay, so I need to be able to add a worker. And worker accounts would be, it'd be ideal if everybody could log in using a wallet, but because the, it's like, it's just better than passwords, period. Um, but there's uh, <clears throat> some fundamental like problems with getting that to work in like a happy way. So um, what I'm going to do is make... Uh, the user login ID is not just going to be the user ID. It's going to be a string 
this concatenated the shop ID, I'm sorry, the business ID hyphen, yeah, business ID hyphen user ID. Um, so it's going to be a little bit of a complicated, a complex number. And I can't do the shop ID because that's going to change whenever they change shop, right? Um, but, you know, we can, these numbers here, like this is this actual shop record. If I, uh, here, if I log out and go to a different one, if Superhero will open for me, uh, how do I do this? No, no, no. Oh, there we go. I'm done. So, okay. So I'm setting this as my new key right now. Um, so if I log in, this is a different company, right? So I'm going to add a shop. Um, you know, whatever, uh, Rikon Mall Outlet. Okay. Which inside of this company would mean something to them, right? They care what it's called. We're like, it's, you got to let your users just pick their own stuff, man. Um, so whatever. Uh, um, lot 34, second floor. Yeah. Okay. And then. Like this is kind of what the data would actually look like, right? Is this kind of thing. And then blah. Um, okay, so like this is kind of what it would look like for them. So change shop to the like outlet mall. Now, what, the reason I'm showing this is <clears throat> this number incremented because that's a global shop number. The shop ID is, you know, is like global to everybody. Uh, we made shops like whatever three and four in the other business account and we just made shop five and this business account well they're like those ids are permanent throughout the system and pretty quickly they become very hard to predict like what the number is going to be for a given business um and that's the same thing it's also true for user ids user ids are a universal id um and so you might create a user in your shop now and he's user 11 the next time you create a user, it won't be user 12. It might be user like 50, who knows? Because that's a shared ID across like, that's a shared sequence rather across all shops. Part of the reason for doing that is to make it harder for uh, effective um, password attacks to happen. Um, the combination of business ID and, which is also a universal sequence, business ID is universal sequence and then um, worker ID or user ID, that's a universal sequence too. That combination is hard to guess, um, which makes it just a little bit more annoying to try to do a brute force password attack. In addition to that, it's annoying to do a brute force password attack. Plus, we can, we can identify very easily when someone's trying to brute force passwords for accounts that don't exist at all. And then I can throw all those IPs. Um, and logging into somebody's account only lets you create new sales and then all they do is time out because nobody paid them which is dumb right and they just get like wiped out of the record eventually um so the worst thing you could do if you log into somebody else's account is like make up fake sales for them you could try to cancel existing sales um but that goes into a refund queue that somebody with control over the target payout account is the only one that's got the authority to, to sign on that. So they can't actually refund. They can't actually give themselves refunds or anything. You can't actually steal money this way. Um, so, so that's that. Um, anyway, so ad worker is where I need to go next. Right now, I think it's just full. Yeah, it doesn't do anything at all. Um, I think ad worker... <clears throat> yeah, ad worker is expecting a none. It's trying to match on user ID none. I don't have user ID none, so that actually just crashed uh, over here, wherever the, the thing is. The like function clause doesn't match because it doesn't matter. Um, 
So let's do, yeah. So this is all working as expected, which is great. So uh, add worker is going to be the next thingy. So add worker and then like edit shops, because this is the boss's account, right? So he would he would want the option to be able to actually edit a shop and have like an edit screen to change the name of it or change like the contact information or whatever. And we'll probably want a, uh, we'll want to do something with the contact information eventually, but we don't care yet. Once I get all this kind of admin type screens, once these are kind of done, this is kind of boring. Now that, you know, if you've watched this video up to this point, then you're going to identify that this kind of work is a little bit boring. Um, but once I've got this done, there's a little bit of busy work here. It's just some typing to get done today to get through this. Um, then I'll be at the more interesting part, which is uh, checking the chain for um, whether transactions went through or not. Combining that with the rate data for a given currency and then populating all this stuff and doing the status updates based on what hits the chain, which can be really cool because I'll be able to do testnet transactions, you know, point my phone at it and be the customer and like see it actually work. That'll be, that'll be cool. There's going to be some JavaScript silliness that I don't know how to do that. Uh, I'll have to figure out how to do. Um, that might be an interesting, thing to to record i can i can definitely do that uh yeah but anyway that's kind of what's happening here with these interface screens and you can see like this project i mean i'm not even using a web server actually they're like i'm getting the raw requests in and i'm just parsing this i'm, I'm parsing this trash web trash pack into a request body and just you know creating a response and sending it back by myself, handling the socket by myself. Um, there's no web server. The entire web server, this module, AJ client, is the entire web server. There is no Apache or Nginx or anything here. Um, and that's just for simplicity for the for right now. The uh, It's also really, really fast, but that's, it's like web pages are so slow today. You don't have to be very fast to make people happy because the web is just a giant flying ball of trash all the time now. Um, anyway, the uh, the way I'm handling TLS, you'll notice this is over unsecured over local host, but that, it, cause it's just like right here at the moment. Um, and the, like Agora, um, Agora views right now, this is in the local network and it's not over TLS because it's just in the local network. Um, but if you use, if you go to agora.jp from outside, you'll see agora. It's HTTPS agora.jp. What's happening is I've got another system that is running nginx as a reverse proxy, and that nginx instance has the TLS certificates to handle TLS between you and it. So between the outside world and the network, the internal network here, um, we have a reverse proxy that's doing the HTTPS stuff. And then inside, it's plain text within the network here. Um, because there's not... The network traffic internally is between the Agora service backend node and the Eternity uh, blockchain nodes. So we have Eternity blockchain nodes that run inside the network here. And that's what we use for lookups and submitting stuff to the chain and like everything, whenever we talk to the chain, we're talking to Eternity nodes that are running inside the network here. So we have um, two mainnet nodes and a testnet node um, running here. So we query them locally, which is like super fast. So it's not, I mean, they respond like real quick and it's great to not have any, any latency trying to talk to a public node. And if then sometimes, you know, the public nodes can get flooded, they can be exposed to DDoS or whatever. Being able to have it all locally is like just better. So that's how we do is we have local Eternity nodes inside of our network. We talk to those over plain text. Of course it's plain text, but then everything on a blockchain is public anyway. There's no secrets. The 
magical thing about the blockchain data is that every single like bit of block data that you get, you can confirm it by hash. So it's not like you have to worry about somebody. There's not like a man in the middle attack you can do on a blockchain the same way. You could always verify it, um, which is nice. And the, uh, <clears throat> yeah, and then talking back to the reverse proxy, that's plain text, but like it doesn't matter. So setting up a reverse proxy as your TLS point just means that you don't have to deal with all the TLS, like the certificate circus and pretending that the web can be possibly secure, which is not possible because like imagine trying to secure DNS for real, which nobody wants to do all these conversations. Nobody wants to have, um, you know, it's like, like the conversations about proof of stake and why that doesn't work. Um, nobody wants to have those conversations. So, uh, anyway, sidestepping all that, just writing a simple web server inside of your project to make it do exactly what you want and not a whole bunch of other stuff that you have to go learn and having a reverse proxy to handle the TLS annoyances. It's pretty simple. Uh, so that's what I've done here. That will probably change if this project grows like really big. If, if this, if this project blows up, that structure may change. Um, just out of necessity, you know, <clears throat> for maintenance or whatever. But at the moment, it works fine for me. And, you know, hey, yay. <laughs> this is CGI bin level web stuff just done a little bit better in Airline than in Pearl. Uh, so I could, I'm wearing my 1998 hat again right now. So anyway, um, that'll be a wrap up for this one. I'll probably do a couple of more like segments today that I'll record. Um, but if I keep going with this, like the stuff that you saw so far, I'm just going to be doing that over again. If something interesting pops up, I guess I'll record it and post it. But, um, you know, the, so secondary concern, I kind of am in the mood to listen to music today and I can't do that on a stream because then I'll get a copyright hit, which is stupid. Um, but that's just how that works. So whatever. There is, I mentioned proof of stake a second ago. I might do a discussion about why proof of stake is not actually a solved problem yet, but everyone's jumping on it because WRF crazy stuff and the dark cabal that wants to control the universe has figured out that that's a way to trick people into like, oh, it's the green blockchain. Um, but they don't, they don't know what they're talking about. And the people that are involved in it don't know what they're talking about. Um, which is really scary, but uh, anyway, <laughs> we need throughput. It's like they they haven't figured out what Eternity already figured out about throughput. Um, anyway, the uh, I might I might do one about that. So anyway, thanks for watching. Bye.